This morning, we're diving into a topic that's very heavy. If you ask why does this topic fit into marriage and family, you've got to look at culture and stats. It tells us that this topic matters. One out of every four women, one out of every three men commit adultery in their marriage. And when you talk about sex and it's put outside of the bounds of what it's supposed to be, it destroys lives, it destroys marriages. Our text this morning is the book of Proverbs chapter five, Proverbs five. When we look at this text, we find Solomon, the king, writing to his son. He is writing in the book of Proverbs what it means to live for Jesus, to live your life on mission, how to live in a world that's simply antithetical to who Jesus is. And one of the things that he deals with early, one of the things that he deals with often, especially in the first nine chapters of the book, is the subject of sex. He goes back to it early and he goes back to it often. It dominates this entire chapter of chapter five that we're looking at this morning. It dominates chapter seven. He goes back to his son over and over and warning about the subject because he knows that it could be the most wonderful thing, but also the most destructive thing at the same time. Sex is not a bad thing. Jesus created it. He made it for one man, one woman within the confines of marriage. This is the design that he has made for this subject. Genesis 2 teaches that a man is supposed to leave his father, his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and the wife were both naked in the garden. They were not ashamed. This was a wonderful thing. It was a beautiful thing. It was a great thing. But it wasn't long before sin entered the world. And we looked at that in a couple weeks ago. And mankind wanted something more than God. This was a temptation that Satan himself gave. He said, if you would take this fruit, eat it, dive into it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And from that point on, what we've inherited in this world is this void, the desire to be satisfied, the desire for longing for something bigger than us. And we see that as a society, we have looked for all sorts of different things to fill that craving, to fill that void. We search for joy and satisfaction in relationships, in sex, in other people. And as a result, we are destroying ourselves as a culture. This is not a shock to you. You know this. You're a part of a culture that spends more money each year on pornography than country music, jazz music, rock music, classical music, Broadway plays, and ballet combined. You're part of a culture that spends more money on pornography than pro baseball, pro football, pro basketball combined. And those are big industries. It has become America's favorite pastime. This is our culture. It's a multi-trillion dollar business. In Paul's day, he would describe that some have begun to worship their stomachs as their gods. Our culture, we could say that the God that we worship is not food anymore, even though that's still true for some, but it's sex. We're obsessed by it. You're a part of a culture that one out of every four young people under the age of four, under the age of 25, have an STD. Most of them for life. You're a culture, part of a culture that if you haven't done it, you really aren't, really aren't a man. It is what's portrayed on the screens, the magazines, television, and the billboards in our city. Everywhere you go, sex is being sold on every corner. And I'm not talking about just prostitution. It sells everything from deodorant, to cars, to domain names on websites. Culture is obsessed with it and we are about to destroy ourselves because of it. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, does this illustration. He says, suppose you come to a country and you could fill an entire theater by simply bringing people in and you put on the stage a covered plate and slowly in lifting the cover so that everyone can see, just before the lights went out, the only thing that you saw was a piece of bacon or a piece of pork chop. Wouldn't you think that country had, something was wrong with the people in that country? Would not everyone that grew, anyone that grew up in a different part of the world that shows up in this country think there was something strange about the fact that people would pay money to watch a woman take her clothes off? Something is really strange. Lewis goes on to say that some might say that the preoccupation with food or this pork chop in this country is because they are starving and they're out of food. Therefore, there's an obsession with food and that's why they go because there's a need inside. But it's difficult to imagine 
that it's a lack of starvation that our culture seems so preoccupied with the subject of sex. It's more likely that it is some twisting of our sinful nature that causes us to view sexuality in the way that we do. Sex is good. It's a beautiful thing. It's a weird thing to be talking about for me on stage. But sex is like a campfire, right? It's, campfires are wonderful. When you light up a campfire and you gather around it and you're roasting marshmallows and you're singing Kumbaya, campfires are a wonderful thing. But if you remove the boundaries from the campfire, you move the rocks out of the way, if you pull the pit from it and you let the fire burn and you just let it go, it's destructive. It destroys. If you did that in our city, especially right now in the middle of this heat, you can burn down entire forests, entire camps, entire cities, your campsite, your tent, your wife, your kids, your husband, your possessions, your own life. It destroys. It burns everything. This is the way sex is when it's not practiced the way it's supposed to be done. This week, just this week, a pastor of a church of 15,000 people in Illinois was fired from his job when the deacon of his church discovered a picture of the pastor kissing a 16-year-old girl in his congregation this week. His indiscretion has destroyed the church, it's destroyed his family, his wife, his kids, his ministry, and the reputation of the gospel in that city. We want freedom, but freedom doesn't come from throwing away God's rules. It comes when we actually stick and follow God's guidelines. There's a false understanding in our culture that says that freedom means no rules. You're free to do whatever you want. But the reality is we don't live that way. We don't say there, we want to live with no rules in terms of driving, especially when we drive on the expressway. No rules. I can drive whatever way we want. I can drive how fast we want. I can drive whatever direction I want. I don't have to stop at speed lights. It doesn't make sense. We know that rules and constraints are good for us. We need liberating constrictions in our lives. Sex is good. God designed it. God knows it. God loves it. It's a great thing within the confines of marriage, the way that God has designed it to be. You want joy? God will give you joy. You want freedom? God will give you freedom. But it comes through submission to God's word with submission to Jesus Christ and how he has made and designed you. Some of you this morning need to be broken over this subject. Some of you need to be encouraged to keep fighting for sexual purity in your life. Some of you need to be mended and encouraged to let the waters of grace wash over you because you've been abused in your life. Some of you need to be rebuked this morning because you're obsessed with the subject. You're more concerned and interested in pornography than you are in the things of God and in the things of your family. Some of you are burned by it and hurt because of sex that you don't want to touch it. So you have like, either don't touch it at all or you let go of all restraints and you do whatever you want with your life. We've got people on both ends of the spectrums. So let's dive in and look at this chapter and have a sneak peek into the conversation between Solomon and his son. We're going to eavesdrop into their conversation. The first thing I want you to notice is sexual sin, it's deceptive. Sexual sin is deceptive. Look at verse one. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Psalm is appealing to his son or his children. There could be many children there. This is the tenth time in a matter of five chapters that he's calling his son to pay attention. Listen up, listen to me, focus, pay attention to what I'm doing. It's what I'm saying. Stop being distracted. Look at me. We've got short attention spans. Drown out what the other voices are saying in culture that are competing for your attention. And listen to what I have to say because it's vitally important, not only for your life, but for the lives of the people around you. Not only for your joy, but for your people that are in your life, for the joy, the satisfaction, your relationship with God, your friends, your family, your spouse, your kids, your future spouse, your future kids. This has benefit for all of that. Solomon knows what he's talking about. Why? Solomon has completely screwed up his life by now. 1 Kings 11 says that Solomon now has 700 wives. 700 wives. 700 mother-in-laws. Good Lord. His wives ended up turning his heart away from God. 
His heart was no longer completely devoted to Jesus. Ecclesiastes 2, Solomon writes that he's going to test himself with pleasure, enjoy himself, do whatever he wants to do, no rules, no constrictions, but he concludes at the end of it that this too is meaningless. So he's speaking to his son and says, listen to me, I've screwed up my life, I've gone down the wrong road, I was young, I was foolish, I was an idiot, I didn't care to listen to people, but listen to me. Learn from my life. He goes on in verse 2 to say, do this so that you can keep from discretion, that your lips may guard knowledge, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. The forbidden woman here is the adulterous woman. But don't think that it's just a woman that he's talking about. It can be anyone or anything that leads you into sexual sin. You can call it whatever you want. It can be a woman, it can be a man, it can be pornography on the internet. Anything or everything that leads you away from Jesus and towards sin, you can put that into context here. It can be a person, a computer screen, a telephone, a magazine, a paper, anything that leads you away from Jesus and into sexual sin. In the New Testament, the word that Paul and Jesus used to describe sexual sin is the word porneia, a Greek word from which we get the word pornography. The word porneia is a broad term. You can put many, many things into it. Jesus says, abstain from porneia. People could have come up to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, can I do this? Can I do that? Is this permissible? Is that permissible? Jesus says, no, abstain from porneia. Why? Because if he had given a list of 30 things that you can't do, some pervert out there would have found number 31 and said, wait a minute, this is not in there, I can do this. So Jesus says, no, abstain from anything that pulls you away from Jesus. Abstain from anything that takes you out of the boundaries and the confines of a husband and wife within the context of marriage, anything, whether you are single or married. Notice Solomon says that her lips drip honey. She's attractive, she's appealing, she's seductive, she's flirtatious, she's drawing him in. Verse 3, her speech is smoother than oil. She's drawing him in with her words. She's a sweet talker. She knows the right things to say. These are the voices that are competing for your attention. They might not be saying anything, right? It might be a billboard. It might be a computer screen. It might be a picture but they're saying something to you, drawing you in, telling you that this is where joy is, telling you that this is where satisfaction is, that you need this, that you deserve this. These are all the voices that are competing for your attention. Verse four, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Wormwood. Wormwood is something that looks very appealing, but not very tasty. It tasted awful. Not even close in comparison, but it's like me, my children seeing candy, and they want it because it's candy, but then they put it in their mouth and it's, it's not sweet. It's one of those sour candies and you can see it in their face. This is nasty. And you can see my daughter like trying to wipe the taste out of her tongue. That's, that's kind of like what Solomon's saying here. It looks appealing. It looks tasty. It looks delicious. You put it in your mouth and it's disgusting. You want to spit it out. And he also says it's sharp as a two-edged sword. A one-edged sword is like an ax. You take an ax, you use it for cutting wood, you use it for building buildings. It's that kind of an ax. But a two-edged sword is for battle. It's for killing. He's giving graphic detail here that the result of sexual sin is pain, it's suffering, it's possible death. In the next verse, he goes on to that. Verse 5. Her feet go down into death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. In chapter 2, he says, he tells his son that her house sinks into death. No one who goes to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Chapter 7, he goes even further. He says, the seductive speech, she seduces him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her like an ox being led to slaughter. He does not know that it will cost him his life. Sexual sin will eventually kill you. If not physically, emotionally, the baggage you have to carry. It will kill you spiritually in your relationship with God. It stands alone in the Bible. There are all kinds of sins in the Bible. But there is something about sexual sin in the Bible 
something very powerful that there's a very strong warning against it. In the New Testament, it talks about how it will destroy you in ways that nothing else will. It's one of the most powerful things that God has made. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul warns them, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin commit, a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral sins against his own body. There's something about sexual sin that it destroys you on the inside. It crushes you on the inside. You ruin something that God has made. It is made for connection. It is made for marriage. It is made for intimacy. And when you do it outside of that context, it destroys you. It pulls something out of you. You lose something about yourself. That's why Jesus, on this context, he would say some radical things. He says that, listen, even if you look at a woman in a lustful manner, you've already committed adultery. He doesn't just connect this with another sin. He connects it with adultery. And he makes some radical statements about the subject that it needs to be seriously considered. Practically speaking, Jesus goes on to say, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck a sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. What does that mean? Practically speaking, it means that if you are tempted at your job by a coworker, it's better for you to quit than to fall into sexual sin. God will honor you. God will take care of you. Don't compromise. It means if you're struggling with pornography, throw your computer away. You can deal with it. It means if you're struggling that bad, get an internet filter. Don't go surfing the net when your spouse isn't near you. It means you go the extra mile to guard your life. It's more important that you guard yourself. If you've got to chuck your computer, chuck your computer. If you need to trash your phone, trash your phone. It means doing whatever it takes to protect your life from destroying it. Verse 6. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander. She, she does not even know it. This woman doesn't know the consequences. Most likely, this woman that Solomon is talking about, she doesn't have a dad, or her dad never taught her how valuable she is. She doesn't even know what she's doing. Sexual sin in this way is deceptive. It looks good, but it's lying to you. It says I'm satisfying, but it's not. That's why Hebrews 11 calls it the passing pleasures of sin. Ephesians 4, 22 calls it the lust of deceit. Lust does not satisfy. You know this from experience. You have to go back to it again and again. It's like an addiction. You have to go back again and again. It gets more intense and more intense, and it eventually destroys you. You're never satisfied by it. Most people that have been exposed for their sexual sin, they not just fall momentarily into sin, but it was started small, something little. They kept doing it, and they got more intensified, more intensified, and the day they were exposed, they destroyed their lives, they destroyed their families, they destroyed their reputations. But it didn't start just a few days before, it started way before. That's why the psalmist would write, talking about the Babylonians, he would say, kill these Babylonians while they're still babies. One of the most cruelest verses in the Bible, but one of the most powerful verses. What's he saying? If these Babylonian babies grow up, they'll destroy me. How does that fit into the context of sin? If you can't destroy your sin while you're still small, it will eventually completely destroy you. Attack it. Destroy it. Fight it. Sin is destructive deceptive. Let me give you an illustration. I'm not a big fan of spiders. I hate them. But when we first moved into our house in Rowlett eight years ago, it was right after they had torn down a forest area to build our subdivision. There were a lot of bugs and a lot of insects that would come into our house. So we called good old Terminex. The first day the technician came out, he actually discovered a black widow in our garage. It's a poisonous spider almost caused me to sell the house and move back to Philly. It's a shining black spider with a red spot on its abdomen. The black widow is a very interesting spider. The female spider is twice the size of the male. When they bite, they release a venom into the body. What's interesting is that while we as humans are scared of black spiders, the black widow, the male black widow is even more frightful of this female. When it comes time for the mating ritual, 
The female lures the black, the male into the web. It makes the web so nice and pretty that he's attracted and he crawls into it. He's lured by his desire and he actually overcomes his fear. His fear is gone. All of a sudden, all of that's gone away. He comes in and realizes that this is dangerous territory. And they embrace, they mate, they have spider sex, I don't know what you call it. Um, but after that, um, the female will try to bite and kill and eat the person that she was just intimate with. He's got to run as fast as he can to escape, to save himself. That's the way it works. He's been lured in. Same context for us. This is what Solomon is trying to get us to see. This looks attractive. It looks appealing. But you get lured in and it will kill you. Sin is deceptive. Number two, sin is destructive. Sin is destructive. Verse 7. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. He's warning her. Don't go near her. He knows our hearts are wicked and prone to wander. He's saying avoid temptation at all costs. Earlier he tells them don't even enter the path of the wicked. Don't even walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Don't go on it. Turn away from it. Pass on. Don't go there. Ponder the, feet that you, ponder the way of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Don't turn your foot to the left or the right and you will be safe. Solomon knew that if you wander through the minefield, you will eventually step on the mine. So his counsel was simple. If you can, go around it. Avoid it at all costs. In chapter 6, he gives his son an illustration. Now, this is me imagining, but in chapter 6, he's sitting by the fire, and he takes his sons, and he gives them a real-life practical illustration. He takes coals out of the fire, begins to throw them on the ground, and he takes one of his servants, his poor peasant servant, so that has to do whatever the king tells him to do. And he tells his servants to start walking on the coal. And now the sons are sitting there laughing as his servant is walking on this hot fire, on this hot coal. And then Solomon then turns to his son and tells him, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can a, one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Same as the one who is with an adulterous woman. He's trying to give them an illustration, trying to tell them, Look, this burns. It's hot. It's dangerous. It's destructive. We know a lot of things can be dangerous. Freeways, expressways can be dangerous. Fire can be dangerous, especially in this time of the year. We watched the wildfires that destroyed the Austin area, Colorado Springs, over the last several months. Often, these fires are started by something very small. Someone forgot to turn their, turn their campfire off. Someone lit a cigarette and left it and it burned and it destroyed the entire forest. Often the destruction can exceed billions and billions of dollars, but it started with something so small, a cigarette bud, someone just simply forgetting to extinguish their campfire. You see, some of you think that your sin is not a big deal. You're not hurting anyone. That it's just between you and no one else. No one is hurt by the fact that you look at a little porn. No one's hurt if it's you and your girlfriend and you touch your body in inappropriate ways. Some of you are starting fires in relationships where you just don't plan on getting married. You're playing around with other people's hearts, just using them. Maybe you're not having sex, but you're definitely fooling around and doing things you're not supposed to be doing. You're dragging their hearts along. If you're going to date and you're not ready to get married, listen, don't date at all. There's no need. Stop playing around with other people. Don't start a fire that you can't put out and don't think that you can put it out or that you have it under control. You don't. This isn't a game. Solomon goes into detail what you lose when you play this game. Listen to verse 9. First thing you lose is you lose your dreams. Verse 9. Lest you give your honor to others and your ears and your years to the merciless. Everything you dreamed of doing, of accomplishing, can go away like that with the sin. It'll cost you your job. It'll cost you your ministry. It'll cost you your, cost you your spouse. It'll cost you your children. It'll cost you your reputation. Most of you in here are here because you are dreamers. You dream big dreams of what you want to do with your life. Great ideas, great passions. You can destroy all of that in an instant 
if you don't have sexual sin, your sexual life under control. Verse 10, you lose money. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. What's he saying? He's basically giving you right there the concept of child support. Having a baby out of wedlock, not being mature enough to marry and take care of them. Now you've got to work and your money goes to someone else. You got to pay money and take care of a child that doesn't even live with you, that doesn't even know you as a parent. Verse 11, you lose your health. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and your body are consumed. You destroy your body when you fool around, especially with the junk that's out there. Verse 12, verse 13, you lose clear conscience. You say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. This is one of the most deadliest results of this sin. This is great regret. I can't believe I did this. Some of you are sitting here today and saying, oh, that's not going to be me. I would never do that. I'll never hurt my wife. I'll never hurt my kids. Paul reminds us in Corinthians, take heed lest you fall. Do, not, do you really think that these pastors that have fallen into sexual sin, that have been embarrassed, that have been destroyed, that have destroyed their churches and their ministries, do you think that they wanted to fall into sexual sin? Do you think these politicians that had great ambitions and dreams of being presidents and world leaders, and when their adulterous affair was discovered, do you think that's what they wanted? Take heed lest you fall. Listen, all of us in this room need to be humble enough to admit and understand that we are just as capable of destroying our life just as anyone else out there, lest for the grace of God. Relationships, love, sex, when they go twisted, when they become gods to you, when you think more about them than you do about Jesus, when you sacrifice to them by spending your money on them, you destroy your life. I'm pleading with you, take heed lest you fall. Number verse 14, you lose your friends. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. In the context here, it was the people of Israel. It was his friends. It was his family. It was his co-workers. It was his church. This is when you lose trust. You lose respect from those people around you who look up to you. The influence that you have on the people around you. Some of you in this room have a lot of influence on the people around you. You can destroy that. Some of you have a lot of influence on the kids that are in our church. You can destroy that. I have watched friends in ministry destroy their lives over sexual sin. I've sat in a room where I've seen a grown man cry as he confessed that he was caught in sexual sin, that his marriage is gone, his kids hate him, his job is gone. I've sat there and watched him destroy his life. And this is a man that wasn't just anybody. He was a man that actually counseled people who dealt with sexual sin, and he fell. Let me be honest, nothing scares me more than this sin. I put myself in their shoes and imagine me screwing up my life for some momentary pleasure. And I imagine the tears in my wife's eyes and her heart being broken. I see my kids losing all love and respect for me. I see you, many of you, who God has graciously allowed me to influence your life, to point you to Jesus on a weekly basis, and I see the devastation that this causes to you. I see how devastating this would be for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when I pray, Jesus, don't lead me into temptation, it's not mere simple words that I pray, but it's an earnest plea because of my family, my kids, my church, my wife, the reputation of the gospel in this city. The reputation of my Savior's name is at stake here. Charles Swindoll says this so eloquently. He says, your mate will experience the anguish of betrayal, shame, rejection, heartache, and loneliness. No amount of repentance will soften their blows. Your mate can never again say that you are a model of fidelity. Suspicion will rob him or her of trust. Your escapades will introduce your life and your mate's life to real possibilities of STDs. 
The total devastation that your simple actions will bring to your children is immeasurable. Their growth, their innocence, their healthy outlook of life will be severely and permanently damaged. Your heartache that will cause your parents, your families, your peers will be indescribable. The embarrassment of facing Christians who once appreciated you, respected you, trusted you will be overwhelming. A dark shadow will accompany you always and forgiveness will not erase it. It will follow you always and will give others license to do the same. The inner peace that you once enjoyed will be gone. You will never be able to erase the fall from yours or others' minds. It will be forever etched on your life, regardless of if you come back to repentance. Most importantly, the name of Jesus Christ, who you once honored, will now be tarnished, giving enemies of the gospel further reason to sneer and jeer. That's an excellent analysis of what happens. I want you to think about that. Some of you have never thought about that. Some of you don't think about the consequences of your actions. If you're single, imagine that you meet someone that you love and you want to get married, but you've been fooling around till then. And now you have to sit there and tell them, here's how I've been living my life. Here's how I've been doing with my life. You've been fooling around, you've been messing around, and now you've got to tell someone that you want to marry, that you love, that you care about, of your past escapades. Here's what I've done in the past. There's forgiveness, there's grace. We'll get to that in a moment. But some of you need to think about this. Third, sexual sin is defendable. Avoid fleeing, building up a defense, getting into God's word. All of these are good things to defend yourself against sexual sin, having accountability, being honest and repentant to people. These are good things. But when you're married, the Bible says that your spouse is a great asset in this area. This part of the past, the point of this next text is to be content and happy with what God has given you. God's blessed you with a wife. God's blessed you with a husband to help you in the area of sexual sin. When you are married, it is Jesus and your spouse. If you're single, it's just Jesus. And that's not a bad thing because if you're single, you can be fully devoted to Jesus, serve him, obey him, busy yourself with the mission of the kingdom, be on mission for him. See, what I love about this section is that Solomon is not a prude. He's not saying, son, sex is bad, sex is dangerous, it's evil, it's gross, just wait till you get married and then do something gross. That's not what he's saying at all. But that's the way we often treat it. Most of our churches will either treat it to say sex is bad, or they'll never talk about it. But Solomon is not saying that at all. He's saying, look, sex in its rightful place is amazing. Verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. I love that it's singular there because Solomon learned his lesson. He tried to have many, many different cisterns, destroyed him. He says, drink water from your own cistern. A cistern is an underground wall, well for getting water. Solomon had his own cistern. This is a place where you go to satisfy your thirst. Solomon is saying, son, when you're married, you should enjoy your spouse and enjoy her alone. You single guys, when you come to the altar and you say, I do, and I pronounce you husband and wife, and you walk down the aisle, nothing changes about you. You're not magically transformed into pure holiness. The problems that you have with lust now as a single person, it doesn't all of a sudden disappear because you were married. It doesn't. Because the issue is not lust, it's a heart problem. And until you address the heart problem, You'll deal with it even after marriage. God designed sex within the context of marriage to help you win this, but you need to go back to the gospel in this. All right, this illustration stinks, especially in the context of the heat that we're in, but work with me here for a second. Imagine that you're freezing cold, all right? Okay, I know that doesn't work right now, but imagine that you're freezing cold. It's bitter cold outside. And all you have is a small little fire. That's all you have. The solution to your coldness is not to extinguish the small fire. You will eventually die from being frozen. The solution is to build a bigger fire. Not to eliminate the smaller fire, but to build a bigger fire. 
you build a bigger fire that you don't need this little fire anymore. It doesn't satisfy you the way this big fire does. How does that apply? The more that you are satisfied and understand Jesus, the more you understand grace, the more that you understand what he's done for you, the more that he is warm to you and the more that he is attractive to you, the less attractive this little fire becomes. This is what Solomon is getting at. There's something greater here. What you're looking for to find satisfaction in a woman, the satisfaction that you're looking to find in another man, will never satisfy you. It only comes in Jesus. Verse 16, Should your water, springs be scattered abroad and streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Solomon's calling here for fidelity in marriage, monogamy. Stay true to yourself. You are not an animal. You need to understand that. Evolution says that you came from an animal so you can do whatever you want. That is not the case. That's not what the Bible teaches. You are made in the image of God. He's calling his son for one marriage between him and one woman. Sin is sad. Sexual sin is destructive. It's tragic. It destroys you. Our culture is not going to encourage you to fidelity. Our culture is not going to encourage marriages. It's not going to encourage you to stay with your spouse and be faithful to them. It's not going to encourage you to be married. It will not encourage you to do that. When you go to your job, your coworkers are not going to encourage you to love Jesus with all your heart, your mind, your strength. They're going to encourage you to wor worship at the foot of pleasure and enjoyment. But you know that joy and satisfaction is not found there. Last thing, sexual sin is detest detectable. Sexual sin is detectable. Solomon wants his son to know that sexual sin is never done in private. There's always an audience. Verse 21. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his paths. Solomon's trying to put some fear into this man. He's trying to put the fear of God into him. Think about it. He's reminding him, God sees you. He wants to be glorified in every area of your life, all of the time, especially when you're by yourself. See, that can be a comforting thought, but that can also be a dreadful thought. The presence of God can be comforting. You feel alone, you feel scared, you feel broken, and the presence of God can be comforting to you. However, it can be a dreadful thought, especially if you're in sin. If you're looking at a computer screen, you realize that God is right there with you. If you're flirting with someone else and no one else knows it, do you realize that God is right there with you? The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. You're never alone. A lot of us theologically, theoretically, you understand that God is watching you and with you. But do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God is there as you're looking at things that you're not supposed to be looking at, as you're having conversations that you're not supposed to be having, as you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing? Because if you did, your life would be one that brings glory and honor to Jesus. God's there. He's watching. He's looking. He's with you to support you, to encourage you. You are His. He knows you better than you know yourself, and yet He doesn't cast you out. If you are His, He will never cast you out. So why are you afraid to talk about yourself? Why are you afraid to hide, that you hide your sins and not get help? You hide this lust in your heart. There's no reason to be afraid. God already knows. Why are you scared of what other people think? Does it really matter? Sin loves darkness. It thrives in the dark places of your life, but it shrivels when light comes up. That's what sin is like. Get it out. Be honest. Stop hiding it. Bring it to light and watch God destroy it. Some of you are just hiding it and think that you have it under control. Any area of sin, not just sexual sin. You think you have it under control. Be honest with yourself. If you conceal your sins, you will not prosper. But if you confess and it forsake it, it will, you will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. Whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Look at verse 22. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he's led astray. Solomon ends where he begins, warning that this will lead to death. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, sin will kill you. You will die for your lack of discipline. You will die for your lack of self-control. It will consume you. You've heard the old phrase, 
Sin will take you further than you wanted to go, will keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you would, what you wanted to pay. Very true. Especially in the area of sexual sin. But you need something this morning. More than just a warning. You need more, something more than just a kick in the butt this morning. You need something more than just bad news. You need something more than just a conviction that this is good, that I need to apply it to my life. You need something more than self-determination that you won't just do this sin again. You need good news. The good news, that it, the good news is that this is true. The good news that is that you will die for lack of self-discipline, for lack of self-control. Sin will consume you and destroy you. That's actually part of the good news. Left to yourself, this chapter will be your epitaph. This chapter will be your eulogy. But the hope is that there is one who resisted sin to the point of death. There is one that resisted sin in every way. There is one that resisted sexual sin, resisted every temptation that we face, the Bible says, yet without sin. There is one that went to the cross and was brutally murdered and said, I will resist sin for you. I will actually do what you could not do. I will resist for you. I will actually go further than that. I will actually pay the penalty for your sins that you deserve. I will take it upon my shoulders. I will, allow my, I will allow sin to wrap its cord around my neck, to choke me, to kill me in your place, so that I can provide for you redemption, to cleanse you, to wash you, to purify you. This was Jesus. He went through all of that. He fought your sin till the end. He won a decisive victory at the cross, so that you, if you put your faith and your trust in Him, will never be condemned by God. If you are His... No matter what you're struggling with this morning, he looks at you and he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees someone who's perfect, righteous, holy because of Jesus. This morning when we come to the table, we don't come in our own strength. We don't come in our own abilities. We don't come saying, God, look at me. But we come broken. We come saying, God, if it wasn't for Jesus, I would have destroyed my life. If it wasn't for Jesus, I would have completely destroyed my marriage. If it wasn't for Jesus, I would have completely destroyed everything good in, that you have given me. So we come saying, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for resurrecting and going to heaven and sending your spirit to guide me, to help me that I am not left alone in this life, but you are there every step of the way to help me. This table is so significant. This is why we do it every week. It's to remind you that you cannot do this on your own. You can't live life on your own. You need his grace. Some of you this week will be tempted. Aren't you glad his spirit is inside of you to say, don't mess it up? Think about your wife. Think about your husband. Think about your children. Think about the gospel. This is why we do this table. Because it reminds us that it is only by His grace that we stand. This morning as you examine your hearts, as you examine your affections, your desires, your attitudes, would you come to a point of repentance? Would you say, Jesus, help? And would you come to the table recognizing that he has paid the penalty for your sin and that you sit because of his grace and his grace alone. And would you participate not just in an act of repentance, but also in an act of worship. Jesus, thank you that I am what I am. I am standing because of your grace and your grace alone. Father, as we examine our hearts this morning, would your spirit bring us to conviction in the areas that we need to repent of? Father, some in this room and some that are watching today, they need to get help. Would you give them the boldness to stop being afraid of what other people think? And would you give them the boldness to get the help that they need so that they live lives that bring glory and honor to you? Some in this room think that they will never fall so they aren't watching and being protective. Would you humble them this morning to realize that it's not because of their wisdom or their ability or their willpower, but it is simply your grace. 
Help us to honor you with our lives. Help us to honor you with our bodies. Help us to be people that not just talk the talk, but we walk the walk. Help us because we know the reputation of the gospel is at stake in this city and how we live our lives. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We love you. Let's worship.